So, hello. Simo, um, parallel computing. What does it mean? Yeah, so uh, like Richard said just uh, previously, in many cases, like you might see a paper or something where somebody says that, okay, we executed, or like a, especially in a, in a talk where people don't have time to explain how they did a thing. They will say that okay, we did a we did a thing with a massive parallel simulation, and we got these results, and and then you're left wondering like okay, how how does it actually like how is it yeah. done actually in in behind it, and in in many cases there there are these like different ways that you can do different things, but they are not differentiated enough so that you like you can actually say, say simply that, okay, they use these kinds of ways. Um, and there are multiple ways that you can do parallel computing. And parallel computing in a nutshell is basically just like you run multiple processes at the same time in some way that you can then get the results uh, done faster. And there are multiple like ways of doing this, uh, like parallel calculations. So you have multi. You can either uh, done, do them completely independently, somewhat together, or you can do them completely like in sync. Mm -hmm. And we are talking. We are going to be talking about these different methods of uh, parallelization yeah. throughout this session. Right. Uh, so, yeah. Right now, does anyone need to know what the methods are? Are we expecting any initial knowledge? Not really. Okay. Not really. Yeah. Uh, okay. Like what I I would so, just say like as a as a like a historical footnote, like this like if you remember if you were alive <laughs> back in like like early two thousands or something around that time, there weren't really that many parallel processors in any of the computers. Like most of the computing that was done, like they were okay. parallel clusters, of course, and mm -hmm. like vast majority of those were using one of the parallelism methods that we are going to be mm -hmm. talking about is MPI parallelism. But yeah. around the year 2000s, you might have heard about Moore's law that mm -hmm. tells about, okay, like uh, that in, uh, number of uh, transistors in a processor is, grow is going to double every two years. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as the processors went smaller and smaller, suddenly at some point there was a situation where there's not that much space anymore for the transistors. So what many processor manufacturers started to do is to add multiple processors into their computers, like into into the CPUs. So your phone might nowadays have like maybe eight processors mm -hmm. and your laptop might have like eight or something like that as well. Yeah. So this change happened, but the programs didn't necessarily change. So, so there's this kind of like, Mo lots of modern pro modern programs already are parallel, mm -hmm. uh, but but lots of older ones might not yet be. Yeah. And we'll see so, how how these different uh, methods happen. So basically, you're saying that processors haven't gotten much more faster than what uh, twenty years ago, but there's more of them, so we have to be able to use more. Yeah, they, they have gotten faster, but at the same time, they haven't gotten as fast as, let's say, mm -hmm. from 60s to 80s or something like that. So, mm -hmm. so, but, but there are more of them, a lot more of them nowadays. Yeah. So, so, so if we look at the picture in the, oh. in the screen, mm -hmm. we can see there that basically in the compute cluster, we of course have lots of processors. So the Triton cluster has about 10,000 processors. Uh, so. When we were talking yesterday, we were talking what is a core, what is a CPU. Well, in in the mm -hmm. case of the computing cluster, like they're like cores of individual like CPUs, but it, it doesn't really yeah. matter. You can just think of it like something that can do com computations. Like mm -hmm. we have ten thousand things that can do okay. computations, yeah. and if you want to utilize them, yeah. we have to try to utilize them in parallel, uh, usually to get the most out of the system. So should we go through the uh, different methods yeah. quickly? Okay, let's see. Can you explain them to me? Um, pretend I'm a new 
undergrad student and don't know much about computers. So in various linking parallel, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, let's let's look at the pretty picture about uh, okay. this. So in this picture so, is each yeah. red box a single thing that's running? Yes. So if we think about the, okay. the cluster that com is compromised of different computers and mm -hmm. different CPUs, you can think of each of these blocks as, let's say, one one core that can take one job each. Um, in the case of an array job, what we like, we have this uh, kind of parallelism called an array job, and what that means is that embarrass it's a it's basically like a situation where if you want to do something over and over again with small variations, mm -hmm. so uh, if you want to do a thing, um, thing like let's say I want to, um, I want to cook spaghetti, and then I want to cook yeah. uh, cook a different kind of a pasta at the same time. I can do them separately in two different burners like like i don't necessarily have to um i don't necessarily have to put them into the same okay. pot or something like yeah. that so i have uh, so it's like i want to make five pots of pasta i can get yeah. five people and do it separately and that works perfectly yes so okay. so if yeah. you have a thing that you can like split up in some way let's say you have a simulation and you have different parameters for that you can embarrassingly parallel that, or run that in an embarrassingly parallel way. So, or there was another term that somebody used, what was was like held like easily parallelizable or something like that. That um, basically means that like you have some, you can split it uh, in some natural way the computation. So you run a different experiment in yeah. a different calculation. You can mm -hmm. split it among different data set, different model, something yeah. like that, something that is very easy to split up. And what, mm -hmm. what in the embarrassingly parallel way that utilizes these ar array jobs, you can like spread them out throughout the cluster all in different places. And you don't necessarily have to worry yeah. where they end up. They just get done. And, and yeah. the question is more about, okay, how can you manage these jobs so that they can get to the queue? How can you put all of your different parameters into the queue? Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so in in the picture here in the below, you can see that let's say we have an one of these array jobs that we would submit. They might get like some of them might get into one computer and one what we could get into a different computer, and they would be completely independent of each other. Yeah. And mm -hmm. there was a question, a great question in the notes that. Do they all have their own copies of uh, variables? And yes, they would. Like they would all be independent. So basically, they would yeah. they would be something to differentiate them, like some sort of like a different yeah. task that they are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But they would all run completely independent of each other. Yeah. Okay, I think so. I understand this. So what's the next version? Yeah, so the next version is this so-called shared memory parallelism. Okay. So this is basically what your laptop is doing, like if you're running something. Mm -hmm. So for example, my my Zoom that I'm talking to mm -hmm. uh, to Richard and to you, right. utilizing most likely multiple processors on my computer to encode the video and do all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And and what it what in the shared memory parallelism, what we do is that we have a process that runs on a computer uh, and that computer that process can like spawn multiple other processes and they can work together in that same computer and why is why is it called shared memory parallelism is that well they are physically in the same machine mm -hmm. like they are working like the processes are in the same machine so they can interact with each other mm -hmm. through the shared memory the shared random access memory that they have. Yeah. So in the in the image in the top, you can see that in the shared memory parallelism, mm -hmm. we want all of the processors in the same physical machine mm -hmm. so that they have access to that shared yeah. uh, memory. So that's and like in... 
when someone in the note says do parallel runs all have their same copy of the variables. So here they do all have the same copy because they access the same memory space. Yes, of course they can have their own like local variables. Each process yeah. can have their own local variables, mm -hmm. but the performance comes in the idea that, okay, they can like share information with each other mm -hmm. and they can like do a calculation together. Yeah. Uh, so, so if you look at the picture at the bottom, you might ha you have a program, like a main program, and that main program might start multiple processes that each yeah. work in a different CPU, mm -hmm. and and they communicate through the shared memory. Yeah, yeah. So if you like a common, this is commonly used, for example, with Python multiprocessing in R. If you're using like um, mm -hmm. parallel uh, in MATLAB, if you're using parallel pool, those all utilize this sort of a parallelism and and various other technologies. One technology is this technology called OpenMP, so open mm -hmm. multiprocessing. Yeah. And what it it's used in many kinds of libraries uh, underneath many like languages. Uh, so for example, like if you're using Python, there's this uh, NumPy library. Yeah. that utilizes these open MP, mm -hmm. uh, so, like yeah. parallelism to do these mm -hmm. calculations uh, automatically with multiple CPUs. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of the metaphor here. So now I have five people cooking pasta, but they're in the same kitchen. And if we want to share the salt or something, I can put it down on the counter and someone else can just pick it up and use it. So we all have the same workspace or something like yes. that. Okay. Yeah, that, that's yeah. a great that's a great analog. Okay. So what's the next one? Yeah. So the next one is this what what I already mentioned this historically uh, mm -hmm. used um, uh, parallelism that is used especially in like the supercomputer kind of a thing, uh, supercomputer systems, and this is called message passing interface parallelism or MPI parallelism. So if you have heard about MPI, uh, this is the mm -hmm. thing. So yeah. in the message passing interface or MPI parallelism, you have a, a like program that is con that consists of multiple programs. So basically you start, let's say thousand copies of the same program on different computers. And, and each of those programs knows that, okay, I'm a part of some greater whole. I'm a part of this great MPI program, mm -hmm. and I need to work together with my with. It's basically like a ant hill. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. everybody's working together, uh, like in, in okay. for the common but good. They're... So okay, in my pasta analogy, so now we can't directly share things. We have to communicate. So is it like we have multiple cooks in different apartments, and if I make mm. something that someone else needs? someone has to get up there, go to the other place, knock on the door, say, okay, I made this for you. And they answer and receive it. And then we go back or yeah, something. Yeah, that would be a good analogy. So, so, so what the NPI programs do is that when you start them up, they create this communication layer so mm -hmm. that they can like, they can share information through each other. And they all, like usually what you would have is that, let's say one process would have its own, let's say, simulation uh, a range or certain um, um, like area of the simulation mm -hmm. that they would handle and what they would communicate to the other processes yeah. are the edge regions of that simulation area so that like they would mm -hmm. do minimal amount of communication with each other but yeah. they would do stuff collectively to simulate let's say a weather mm -hmm. model, model or something like that okay yeah so like you divide it up into different domains like physical domains and each edge condition can do things yeah so what is mpi most often used for it seems a bit harder to use or program yes whatever. so so it is uh, much com more complicated because the program usually needs to be designed around the communication also like the algorithms that are used it's quite often used in in like physics simulations Mm -hmm. So, for example, like CP2K, G4 lamps, open foam, okay. many many yeah. weather model, like all weather models okay. usually do that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
and you usually need to build the program around the communication layer. Okay. So, yeah. so basically, you need to design your program to be an MPI program. Yeah. So it's it compared to like the multiprocessing thing uh, okay. or the shared memory parallelism, where the programs are usually like like you can just like yeah. quite trivially usually uh, use them in different kinds of contexts. The MPI programs are usually like you need to from ground up design the program to be an MPI program. But it's it's very powerful when you design a program like that because yeah. then you can utilize these supercomputers. Yeah. Okay. Are there any more methods? Well, the last oh, one. Yeah, GPUs. You, I see. Yeah, you might have heard is is GPU uh, parallelism, and and it's a different kind of a like a parallelism basically because like in a GPU you have like internal parallelism in the GPU card itself. So this graphics processing unit. So they are basically like big vector calculators that can do like a lot of lot of calculations in parallel. So let's say um, like they can multiply a matrix really fast. And but but they are in the GPU. So what you usually when you have a GPU program uh, it's it's parallel in a sense that you you have a CPU part, and then usually that CPU part tells the GPU program, that, okay, like here's mm -hmm. some, let's say, matrix you need to multiply, mm -hmm. and here's another matrix that you need to multiply with, and yeah. and then you they are transferred into the GPUs, this VRAM, so this video RAM. Uh, they yeah. they have the GPUs have their own fast memory that they can access, and then there these individual like calculating units they're often called like CUDA cores or compute units or something like that they do the calculation in parallel so they work basically like this kind of like a yeah like a fast calculator for these kinds of programs that can do a lot of stuff in in parallel uh, and but but the, but they don't it, and of course, there's cases where you you also have programs that where the calculations are done using, let's say, let's say some uh, communications so that you can have multiple GPUs yeah. working together. But mm -hmm. but usually the GPU parallelism is like internal to the program okay. Uh, okay. structure, and that also means that your program needs to be designed to use GPUs, or yeah. well, it can't use the GPUs. So what's a good metaphor here with my pasta analogy? Is it like you have one of these, well, um, well, if you want to, let's say you want to make the pasta sauce and you have like an onion slicer or something like that, uh, and you, you just, okay. you just can slice the whole onion with one go, yeah. but you cannot really cook pasta with that really. Like you can, yeah. <laughs> it, it does that one thing in parallel, instead of like chopping with the knife, you can just like chop a full onion at yeah. one time. Actually, I could show my slide with the GPU metaphor for the yeah. pasta thing. Okay, yeah. I'll switch to my screen here. Uh, there. So this is part of some other thing. But in the cooking metaphor, so what we see here is from some restaurant in Switzerland where they're cooking a bunch of chickens on a fire. And here... It's designed where you could cook probably 20 chickens at once. And sorry for vegetarians, I am too, but this is, well, the metaphor I found. So with this, with very little effort and quite good efficiency, we can cook so much food at once. But how much pasta can we cook in this machine? None. Like yeah, it's, not, it's not like, that many. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the GPU is intrinsically suitable for some types of problems, but not all types. So if it matches the GPU model, you can do a whole lot. But if it doesn't, well, it just doesn't run there. Yeah, yeah. with the GPUs, like because why the GPUs are powerful, they like uh, why they are like that. They originally were, of course, like for historical reasons, designed for computer graphics. And in, if you do like 3D computer graphics, you need to do a lot of like 
uh, rotations and that sort of stuff in order to calculate like vector graphics in mm -hmm. in the computer mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. And and that's why the computers the, or the chips of the GPUs were designed to do lots of these like matrix calculations. Yeah. And then event like afterwards, people realized that hey, what if we use these really good matrix calculation units to do all kinds of other computations. Mm -hmm. And then they, when let's say the deep learning boom started, people realized, okay, like mm -hmm. we can run these models in GPUs yeah. very efficiently. And just today I saw news that NVIDIA is, uh, has, has surpassed Apple in the stock price. Uh, so, okay. so they have yeah. basically like the, the GPU trend is, is ongoing and it's going really fast because these can be utilized as long as you can mm -hmm. formulate your program in this kind of like a matrix yeah. kind of a way mm -hmm. you can usually utilize gpus to okay. do these fast yeah. calculations yeah and that's why you said it has to be completely designed around the gpu basically from the start mm. so i before we move forwards to the actual like the first examples and first exercise um i we want i want to talk a bit about like what is what is serial and what is parallel in your code so, so not every program parallelizes like if with the like GPU parallelization or the shared memory parallelization because every program by design or like by by maths basically <laughs> uh, needs to need, needs to have a serial part or it has a sum part that is serial part and then you have some parallel part and if you like parallelize that parallel part you can get different amounts of speed up based on mm -hmm. well how much of the program execution was done in parallel. Yeah. So so for example in the first mm -hmm. picture you can see that the there's only a small parallel part and if you parallelize that with two CPUs, so you basically divide it by half mm -hmm. and then you run it with two CPUs, you only save a small amount of time. But if you have like yeah. larger parallel part and you uh, parallelize it, you get a bigger time save. So it depends on your program. And and this is why the embarrassingly parallel is often the best case parallelism in many cases, mm -hmm. because not every pro problem is easy to parallelize in these like more advanced ways. And it's not a it's not a problem. Like like not everything like so so not yeah. everything goes faster by adding more thing yeah. more like power to it. So for example, like Ferrari doesn't go faster in Finnish roads because the speed limits. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. okay. like you can what, use an older car as well. What about uh, this metaphor? So with the pasta thing again. So if I have two people making pasta in my house, it's probably still okay. Okay, actually this metaphor isn't perfect. But let's say I have 50 mm -hmm. people making pasta in my home or in one home and it has one sink, eventually everyone's going to need to use the sink and there'll be a queue there. That's actually or not you, correct. Yeah, but if you, oh. if like, or let's say like, if you break the pasta in half, like if mm -hmm. you break the pasta in half and cook it in two pots, does it cook any faster? Like, do you get it done any faster? And most likely not because like the pasta has a set cooking time. Yeah, yeah. That will always, like pasta mm -hmm. in a sense is always like, it will only yeah. cook for certain yeah. <laughs> for certain minutes. Like you cannot make it faster by by spreading like putting it into multiple pots. Uh, usually, at least. Yeah. So, so that's good to keep in mind when doing parallel computations. Yeah. So, so should we start doing them? Oh. There's one more oh, question though. So. Um... It's a question running same simulation, different random sets. Inside each simulation, I use a GPU for large matrix multiplications. Each simulation in diff is in a different CPU, but how to handle the GPU part. So this is somehow mm. related to the, um, the combining different forms of parallelism. Yes. I think it's so, not so in exactly what's there, but mm. yeah. Yeah, so so there are like like for this uh, one one thing that you can remember is that you can combine these different methods of parallelization. You can combine like you can run if you have multiple different simulations, you can run this kind of an array job, this embarrassingly parallel simulation with 
with each job that has like so that the each job has a GPU. Like if if your code uses GPUs. Yeah. Yeah. In that case, if you have a like a simulation, then then you need to use a GPU to like yeah. do some part of that simulation. There are methods for that, but but it requires a lot more finesse so that the different CPUs can communicate with the GPU. I mean, in many cases, you might have a situation where you have one processor that discusses with the CPU, uh, sorry, with the GPU, and the other processors processors are doing the simulations. So you have yeah. basically like a shared memory part of the simulations, and then you have one part that does the matrix multiplication with the GPU. So you have basically like these yeah. two linked by one CPU. But yeah. this is a like a special case. So but but do remember that they, they it's possible to combine all of these methods together. Yeah. And if you scroll down the page more it finally says the research software engineers can help with parallel computing. And this is something yes. I'd really recommend. I mean these things are confusing. Even when I'm doing things, I'll often ask CMO just to make sure that I'm running it correctly or to save me some time. So if you get to the point where you wonder how it works and you're at Alta University, we're here and our job is to save you time figuring out this stuff. So come by and ask. I will also mention that it's, it's always a good idea before creating your own, let's say, computing framework or something, it's always good to check if somebody else has done it before you, because like, like many of these computing, like parallel things are complicated to write. So mm -hmm. you don't usually want to write your own. There's usually like, for, for, for example, for R, there's the parallel package and for Python, there's multiple, like Jobalib, and there's a m parallel, like my many parallel processing libraries that already like, like do this kind of stuff so that you don't necessarily have to worry about how it's done underneath it. So, yeah. so keep that in mind, uh, like whenever using code, it's a good idea to use code because like writing the yeah. actual like communication that, that sort of stuff is <laughs> okay. super communicate, super yeah. complicated. Usually. So most people that are listening to this won't be writing their own parallel code, but they'll be using existing libraries or frameworks and yeah, Make I would. I, yeah, I would recommend at least that. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. You can always write your own, but <laughs> that's. A... Yeah. So should we move forward to the array yeah. jobs and actually get to do something? Okay. So I'll flip back yeah. to my screen.